Evening and welcome to um, evening and welcome to the, our first Ask the Farmer Q and A session for this series. Uh, my name is Bridget Barry from Farming for Nature. Uh, Farming for Nature was set up to inspire and encourage farmers that farm or wish to farm more for nature. One of the ways we do this is um, through uh, finding exemplary farmers who are Farming for Nature ambassadors. Um, and this Q&A series is a great way to hear from our ambassadors, hear their kind of tried and tested methods on their farms, and also to share any uh, pressing questions you have for these farmers. So over the next hour, I'll kickstart the event um, with asking the speaker a series of questions. And then we encourage any of you to write any questions you have into the chat box below on your banner. And uh, I'll facilitate these questions and ask them directly to the speaker. If you miss, uh, this session or part of the session or you think someone else might enjoy it, it will be up on our YouTube channel within um, the next uh, day or so. So on to tonight's um, session. Um, I am delighted uh, to welcome Owen Dalton. Owen is farming uh, 73 acres down in West Cork on the Barra Peninsula. He practices both high nature value farming and uh, part of his farm is set to rewilding as well. So I'm looking forward to our conversation this evening. Just because uh, either Owen or I have quite bad uh, broadband, one of us keeps freezing, that Owen and I are both going to turn off our videos now. And if everyone else wants to turn off their videos as well, that's perfect. Um, so I'm just going to stop my video, as is Owen, and then we'll get started with the conversation. Owen, thanks so much for joining us this evening. Um, so you arrived in West Cork about 13 years ago. Um, can you describe for us your journey into farming and onto this particular uh, farm? Hi, Bridget. Uh, thank you for having me on. Um, delighted to talk to you. Um, yes, well, as, as you know, I'm from Dublin and in 2009, uh, myself and my family, we, we sold our house in Dublin and bought a 73 acre farm. Uh, now, to be quite honest, when, when I bought it, I had no intention of farming, doing any farming of, of any sort whatsoever. What I was interested in was the fact that um, the, the farm had actually been left disused for quite a long time before we came. Uh, doing some some detective work subsequently, I I worked out that probably um, for around a century, very very little was done with the land, and what that did was that it allowed whatever fragments of wild habitat were on the land, largely in the in the form of um, wild native woodland. It allowed those refuges to spread out uh, through through natural regeneration. That the trees self seeded into surrounding land uh, and formed uh, a forest, a really beautiful forest of um, uh, a great diversity of wild native trees: oak, birch, holly, willow, uh, hazel, rowan and many others. So that was what attracted me to the place. And my, my plan was really from the beginning was to uh, conserve it and restore it and, and not do a whole lot else with it. Um, one of, one of when, when I arrived, uh, despite the fact that there was this beautiful forest, it was also in a really, really bad state in the sense that it was very severely overgrazed by feral goats and seca deer. Mm -hmm. And that severe overgrazing was facilitating the in invasion by a whole range of non-native invasive plant species, including rhododendron ponticle. So really my, my only, my only objective for the first years after coming down were, were to resolve those ecological problems. Uh, the place was in a terrible state and my, what I wanted to do was to turn that around, which I did. I, I applied for the native woodland scheme to fence out the goats and the deer. 
Mm -hmm. And I set about removing the rhododendron and other invasive plant species by myself in my spare time. Mm -hmm. um, it was only after several years that I started to give thought to putting some livestock on the on the mountain because the the a, a large part of the farm was uh, a share of mountain commonage which obviously I couldn't do the kind of thing I was doing in the forest I couldn't do ecological restoration there because you know all you can really do with commonage is, is put livestock on it to graze it but mm -hmm. it was an obvious source of income because we you know I mean moving down here the aside from the the ecological restoration I was doing on the land you know there's a whole other story there which I tell in in my book that's just been published just over a month ago an, an Irish Atlantic rainforest mm -hmm. uh, congratulations and thank you <laughs> and I'd recommend that anybody who really wants to know the story in in details should should read read the book because it's all in there mm -hmm. you know um but there was a lot more to it i mean we had to the the, the 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 farmhouse that was on the land was a complete ruin so the first step was to try to get planning permission to build a new house uh, and we were renting at the time uh, nearby and then to once we got planning permission to actually go and build a house and I had my, I'm a sculpture conservator. I have a business restoring and conserving sculpture all over Ireland. So I had that to attend to. So it was really, you know, it, there was a lot going on. Mm. But as I say, over time, I started to give thought to the fact that the commonage was there and we weren't using it in any kind of a way. And so I decided to, to put uh, a few animals onto it just just to have some income from from that part of the land. Um, and initially I was interested in in cattle. Uh, my first thought was to to buy um, Galloway cattle, um, not the belted Galloways, but the, the actual mm -hmm. uh, pure Galloways. But I was talked out of it because the land is extremely rough. A lot of it is rock. It's a mountain. Um, and probably, you know, I've, I, I don't know for sure, but I would say, you know, certainly there are parts of it where it would be over 50% rock. It's extremely rough uh, and with a lot of escarpments and cliffs and, and you know, very, very, very rough ground. So and some of my neighbours said, you know, sheep would probably be a better option. Mm -hmm. And even though I wasn't really that keen on the idea of sheep, because I know that they're ecologically, they're very damaging, um, but it seemed to be the only realistic option for the commonage. And so I got some sheep and I put them there and I had sheep for the for five years on the commonage and I never got on with them. I never liked them. Um, <laughs> and I think. I think in hindsight, the reason for that, the main reason was that at the back of my mind, there was always the, the an awareness of just how ecologically damaging sheep are and, and the extent to which that contradicted everything else I was trying to do mm -hmm. in terms of ecological restoration and so on. So, you know, after five years, uh, I finally realized that this was made no sense and I sold the sheep off mostly in Kenmare Mart but a few went to neighbours as well uh, I had 34 at the end um, and I got some Dexter cattle instead um, and they they spend most of the year on the mountain commonage mm -hmm. I bring them into my own place uh, in the winter months from around mid-December um, although a couple of them will be coming over at the at the start of December in a few weeks, um, and then they go back onto the commonage around mid mid March, and the reason for that is that um, in my own place now, uh, as you said, like 
with most of my own private ground, I set it aside under the native woodland scheme, and there's there there's there's been no grazing there whatsoever mm -hmm. for well over a decade. And that has seen that saw the forest just absolutely explode with life um, with new naturally regenerated wild native trees with a really diverse ground flora and a whole influx of all sorts of other species and life into the into into that area the, the results have just been simply wonderful um, that that area is about 21 and a half acres uh, we have another eight and a half acres across the road, the main road from that, where we, there's a slightly different thing been going on. Um, it, this piece of land slopes up towards the mountain commonage and is quite similar to the mountain commonage in many respects. Um, but the fact that, that that hasn't been constantly grazed now for probably seven or eight years, and a similar process of transformation is happening there too, with um, native trees springing up all over the place, and a really uh, rich um, diversity of wildflowers, um, such as Devil's Bit Scabious and um, Bog Asphodel, and and many many others. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll put the dexters in there in the winter. Mm -hmm. And because the, 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 lea the trees have lost their leaves at that time of the year, uh, and most of the, the native flora is, is kind of, it's dormant, the, the, the dexters and their grazing won't adversely impact that area in that, despite being there over that time. And it's something that I've been doing now for a few years since I got the Dexters, and it seems to be working in the sense that the area seems to be benefiting ecologically from the presence of the Dexters um, over the winter months. So, so I just want to ask a few questions here because um, sure. I know that you've you know you've got a fantastic story and it's it's really easy to listen to, but I just I just want to clarify a few things. Uh, so yeah. how many dexes do you have and are they sucklers are you like do you, are you coughing in the outwintering and are they supplement fed okay so we started out with three so we got two uh young heifers and a cow and two of them turned out to be in calf when they arrived <laughs> so that the three turned you into increased five. your population yeah yeah nearly doubled <laughs> in, in the space of a few months three turned into five yeah. and then um we got a loan of a bull there last winter and so the the five have now become seven with two new calves um, so there's seven altogether, including the 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 the, the new calves. Um, so yeah, to, to answer your question, the the they're sucklers. Um, mm. You know, the, there's no dairy here to speak of, really. And do you need to supplement feed them, or do they have sufficient grass on the eight acres that you're kind of you have them out in? Well, between between the commonage, as I said, like they spend most of their most of the year on the commonage, and then oh yeah, sorry, in the winter is what I meant. Yeah, yeah, in, in the winter because that that area has been on left ungrazed all year, so it's mm. it's kind of like a repository of of material to eat. And last winter, I also experimented with putting them into the woods for a short space of time, also in the winter. Mm -hmm. where there's plenty of ivy for them to eat and, and things like that and plenty of shelter and again the, the area seemed to benefit ecologically uh, to a great extent from their presence you know their mm -hmm. their the disturbance of their hooves and um their dung because they're they're organic they're they the any any feed that they get is organic um, and I try to avoid chemicals of any sort. Um, you, you asked me whether they get supplemental uh, feeding. Mm -hmm. I do give them a very small amount of organic cattle nuts um, every now and again, 
but that's not really so much to feed them. It's more just so that they know me and that they come when I call them mm-hmm. and that they're manageable. You know, that's it's really very, very small amounts. Mm-hmm. No, it's it's interesting. So you have your maternity ward uh, at the bottom of the, the commonage and then you have the commonage. So I suppose it's it's transhumance. Well, it's kind of a long, it's a nine month transhumance, really. It's uh, that they're up in the... The highlands. Yeah, it, it is. It's like a form of bullying or mm-hmm. transhumance, as you say. Um, ex- with the difference, obviously, that bullying involved people actually following the cattle and, and living with them up on the uplands, whereas I obviously don't do that. Mm-hmm. And tell me, uh, so it's commonage, and a lot of your neighbours you mentioned possibly have sheep up there. What do they think about you with your Dexters on the commonage? Um, they're, they're, they're fine with them. I mean, I think, you know, Dexters are really, they're, they're lovely animals. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, people have really started to enjoy seeing them because they, they'll often be down near the, the main road. Uh, so people see them as they're going by, you know, and I think people have kind of gotten used to, uh, they've, they've, they, they enjoy that now and seeing when new calves arrive or, or whatever else, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so and I'm not the only one who has cattle on the mountain. There, there is another neighbor who has some cattle, but we obviously try to keep them separate. So our farm has shares in the commonages of two townlands, uh, Bothical and Fonkill in the woods. Mm-hmm. And they generally tend to stay over on the Bothical side, whereas my neighbors would stay over on the eastern Fonkill side. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we, we keep them separate, you know. And this might be an obvious question, but just it's just not one I know the answer to. But if you're organic, is there any challenges for farming on a commonage in that context? Not really. I mean, I, I'm organic in the sense that I avoid uh, giving them, uh, you know, I, I avoid introducing chemicals and I the, the feed they get, the little bit of feed they get is organic. But I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not part of any organic scheme or anything like that. I'm not registered as organic. It's, it's just something I do, but um, I just find I have enough to be getting on with without going through all of the kind of paperwork to actually to establish myself as organic. Yeah, fair enough. But I, I think also Dexter seems to have quite a good market. I mean, do you sell your meat in local markets or is it in kind of the mainstream butchers or to be honest i haven't got to that point yet of selling any animals um but i'm i'm guessing because what seems to be happening certainly around here is that the whole thing of dexter seems to be catching on that there seems to be more and more people who are choosing to move towards dexter's often as an alternative to sheep, but sometimes as an alternative to other breeds of cattle. Mm-hmm. Uh, they just make so much sense in a in 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 rough ground like Barra. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it was in this kind of, it was in Southwest Ireland in in on ground very like this that they were bred in the first place back in the 18th century from local mountain cattle so they're perfectly adapted to this Mm. um and and so i think what what's more likely to happen when i do go to sell animals in fact funnily enough the only the other day i was talking to a neighbor who said he heard about another guy who lives nearby who's looking for dexter so Mm. you know and I may very well sell a couple in the next few months, um, you know, but I'd, I'd say it will happen more that way rather mm-hmm. than, you know, selling them for me. But, you know, we'll see what happens. I, I think they're hot property at the moment, right? I, I have heard such, yeah. <laughs> such no, rumours, especially believe, with acres and stuff. Absolutely. But I think that that's more for uh, for rare breeds like Dexter's that are pedigree that are pedigree that have all their papers and all which oh, I see. Dogs, you know yeah yeah i mean i'm sure there's some knock-on effect as well but i think that the real premia are for the the, the pedigree uh, animals 
Yeah. Before we move on to the other section of your farm, which I'm really interested to know about, uh, you know, you you came down from Dublin via Italy. Um, you set up, you know, a farm. You didn't necessarily think you were going to go into it, but you started with sheep and moving into cattle. I mean, it seems that you've really kind of tried and tested quite a few methods. Is there, is, is it just through your own kind of tried and tested or is someone, have you gone to anywhere for advice on farming this type of habitat or where would you suggest that people go or where, where did you get your advice? Well, you know, I've been kind of juggling a few different things uh, all along. My priority, as you can probably tell, has always been first and foremost um, wild nature. Mm. You know, so if you have a, if you were to imagine a spectrum uh, of in terms of balance between product productivity and and leaving space for nature, uh, and on on one end of the the scale you have some kind of a intensively farmed. Mm piece of ground in, I don't know, County Meath or somewhere, um, which is just Italian ryegrass or whatever else, one mono monoculture um, growing there. That, if, if that's one end of the spectrum, then what I'm doing is the very opposite end of the spectrum in the sense that productivity is an aspect of what I'm doing. There will be some food will come out of what I'm doing, but it's mm -hmm. really the focus is totally and utterly on trying to achieve the best possible results I can for nature within the confines of trying to make a living mm -hmm. and survive down here. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that was going to be one of my questions, but I might as well ask it now because you've led into it is, I mean, does it work for the bottom line? You know, do the, the cattle pay for themselves in, in that context? I mean, I think I'll I think I'll make something out of it. You know, for the first few years, there were very high expenses because a lot of the the, the farm wasn't fenced, and I'm not just talking about the deer fence now, which mm. was covered by the native woodland scheme. I mean, the actual fences around other bits of ground to to keep neighbors' sheep out and so on. Um, so there were very high overheads uh, for quite some years now. A lot of those expenses are are kind of like one offs or, or certainly for a couple of decades anyway. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I, I'll, I'll start making some money out of it, um, I think. But what I would say is that, you know, most of my income would come from my business, mm -hmm. restoring sculpture. Um, and things like that and that's very normal around here in the sense that really there, there's nobody certainly nobody that i know of and I, I i believe you know in the whole of the Bear peninsula there's probably only one or two people who actually make a living purely from farming everybody has some other kind of a sideline whether it's a little shop or you know, a trade or or whatever else. Maybe they have a little boat that they go out and do lobster pots or whatever, you know. Mm. Everybody has to have a few uh, strings to their bow down here be, mm. just because holdings are small and uh, the land is generally very rough, you know. So that's, that's quite normal, I think. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. So moving on to the kind of the rewilding part, um, Part of your farm, you know, as as per the title of your book, is a Irish Atlantic rainforest. For those of us who don't or aren't as lucky as you to kind of have that on our doorstep, what what does this look like? It's amazing. Or what does it sound like? What does it what does it feel <laughs> like? You know, all your senses are on, on, on all you. on all of those levels. It's really yeah. just amazing. I, I was in there earlier today, and. The, the incredible thing is that even though it's getting on for 14 years now since I came here, it's still really just, you know, it just it just absolutely engages every single sense every time every time I go in there. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. And, and, and I know that that will still be the case when I'm, you know, uh, an owl having to be carried in and out. 
<laughs> it, it'll, it'll still be the way. It's just, it's, it's one of the problems I think we face in this country, Bridget, is that people have never experienced places like this. Uh, mm. So, you know, it, it's, it's probably quite abstract for people to listen to me saying how amazing it is because mm. it's so difficult to find anywhere where you can experience um, just the level of, of beauty and complexity and, and aliveness that mm. I experience every single time I walk in there. And it's constantly changing. It's very dynamic. You know, it's, 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 it's very far away from the kind of thing in which, you know, you go in there a few times and then, okay, you've, you've kind of more or less seen everything. It's, mm -hmm. it's totally the opposite because it's, it's constantly changing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's partly down to the seasonality, but it's also just, you know, all the really dynamic processes that have been unleashed with the, with the, um, with the end of overgrazing and the removal of the, the invasive plants and, and all the rest of it. So you, you fenced off, you kept the deer out, you took out some <clears throat> the rhododendron and then yeah. on an annual basis, do you like, do you do much to kind of manage it or do you kind of just let it, let it off? Yeah, I don't do a whole pile. Uh, the only thing I, th there's a few things that I do. So, you know, I still have to go around and look for rhododendron and other invasive species like Chilean myrtle. Uh, and I do that generally. I mean, it's just part of the time that I spend in there. I go in there for my own pleasure anyway. And if I happen to come across any of those things while I'm doing that, then obviously I pull them out. Um, but that's an ongoing task because you know, the, these things, they seed in from the surrounding lands um, and that will probably never cease. So that, that, that is required on an ongoing basis. Uh, as I say, particularly in the winter, you, they tend to stand out more when all of the native flora uh, becomes dormant and, and the trees lose their leaves and so on. Um, after storms, I often go around and check the perimeter fence because you can get branches or trees falling on it, which can compromise sections and, uh, you know, the, the, the deer could start getting back in. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond that, beyond, I guess, I mean, both of those things, what you're really talking about are managing invasive species, whether it's Sika deer or or the rhododendron. Um, so in terms of actually managing the natural habitat itself, there's only one thing I do. Mm -hmm. And that is I sometimes uh, cut back the briars a little bit because otherwise there's the risk that they would take over. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess what you need to understand is that, you know, when I arrived and the, and, and the forest was completely overgrazed, is there was nothing there from about head height down it was a completely artificial situation in in the sense that you know it, it's not a natural um situation to have such high densities of herbivores and such severe overgrazing overgrazing mm. but nor is it a natural situation to have a complete absence of grazing or browsing but given the two choices mm you know you kind of have to if you if you want the, the the trees to regenerate and so on your only choice at the moment is to fence out the the deer and that and to have no grazing but what that does is it allows uh, the brambles the briars to to if they can take over a bit because mm -hmm. they grow very aggressively <clears throat> and that would leave that would lead to an impoverishment of the ground flora so you know, it's something I do in a relaxed way. It's, it's you know, I, I just cut uh, the odd one here or there as I go around sometimes. That's the only thing I do to, mm -hmm. to manage the land in any way. Yeah, because I was watching your video, your Farming for Nature video earlier. So for those of you who haven't seen it, Owen has a five minute video on his land, taking us through the, his farm and what he does there. And, you know, you kind of mentioned what a hotspot of kind of lichen and liverworts and fungi it is. What's 
like nature has obviously responded, you know, you've been there only 13 years, it, it responded quite fast, did you find, to your management practices? It did, but it varied hugely in the sense that, you know, there were areas where, uh, for example, if we talk about areas that weren't forested, where there was only grasses, um, often, often just um, uh, what they call finon down here, which is, um, uh, Molinia or purple mm -hmm. moorgrass. Um, so, it, if you talk about the areas that were covered in that, which were about, you know, in the 21 and a half acres that were fenced off from deer, uh, I'd say about a third of that land was was unwood, unwooded and was mm -hmm. just covered in grasses. And in those areas, you've 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 seen natural regeneration of trees and other really nice flora happened but at, at, at extremely varying rates so mm. you know at one end of the scale you know within six or seven years where previously you only had grasses you had closed canopy woodland mm -hmm. you know uh, with ground flora like uh, wood sorrel and dog violet and celandine starting to move in very rapidly so the spontaneous formation of a really rich uh, woodland ecosystem in, in very rapid time. Um, but at the other end of, the, the, of that scale, after those same six or seven years, you just had the odd seedling coming up here or there mm -hmm. um, of maybe birch or rowan, and then everything in between those two extremes. So, it's been hugely variable and I think there's there's a range of factors behind that variability. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to um, pass it over to the crowd now to see if anyone has any questions. There's a few who have come in already, but before I do, I'll just ask you one more question uh, and then we'll take a break for me and, and we'll go into the, crowd, uh, into the audience as such. And yeah. um, what one memory stands out for you regarding the nature that you've seen on your farm? Is there over the last few years, is there something that stands out for you and you go, God, that's it. I, well, well done me. I deserve a clap, a, a kind of a <laughs> slap on the back. Is there anything, is there anything that stands out for you there? Owen? That's a very difficult question to answer because as I said, you know, when I go into the woods and the surrounding area, there's always new things to see and you're never, you're never left wanting in, in terms of, you know new things or exciting things uh it's the most wonderful thing about it but if if forced to, to try to 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 name a couple of moments i suppose um some that stand out would be the first time i saw pine martin in mm -hmm. the woods i noticed that uh chris Barron is on here uh, viewing um us this evening <laughs> and um Chris is an important part of that because it was Chris who who showed me how uh, when I was at a bio blitz in the Burren in County Clare in 2013, I think it was, Chris showed me how to recognize the scats of Pine Martin. And several oh. years ago, I started to see scats in the woods that looked very similar to what I remembered as being those of Pine Martin. So, I was suspecting that they might have moved in, but there was one day where I actually saw one and that was a really special moment, not just because it was the first sighting of what is Ireland's rarest na native mammal that, that they showing that they'd taken up residence in the woods, mm -hmm. but also just the, the actual the way it happened was very, very special. Um, and an, another similar moment would have been when I saw an otter appear mm. in one of the streams running through the woods it's it's nice to hear you know uh, we were saying before we came on that very often when you work in conservation or biodiversity uh, there's not so many happy endings uh, so it's nice when you do get to to speak to someone who's you know nature's come back to their land and stuff and that's that's really nice to hear well done so yeah, going into the you. crowd here owen um julian gallagher has asked have you tried to extend the size of wildland by talking to neighboring farmers or any other collective efforts? 
I haven't because I know that nobody would be interested. Um, and they, I, to be honest, they'd be right not to be interested. Now, that sounds very strange coming after everything else I've said up to this point. But I guess what you have to understand is that by rewilding much of my land, I've essentially f decided to forego income, income from that land for for a long period of time um, and it's completely unreasonable to expect most farmers to do anything like that because farms are their livelihoods and they depend on their farms to survive so to expect farmers to to give up their livelihoods for wild nature i'm not saying nobody's going to do it but it's going to be only a, a tiny minority uh, and and that's something that really needs to change we need to we need to give farmers the option of of certain of of surviving uh having being able to survive also based on rewilding their land rather than only farming it mm -hmm. how like hopeful are you for the future of you know, say payments for ecosystem services. I mean, and, you know, I mean, farmers, many farmers like yourselves in marginal areas are, you know, if working to manage the land for biodiversity or producing, you know, capturing carbon or producing uh, wild, what not, protecting wildlife and producing more fertile soils and stuff, I suppose, for the benefit of all of us. But how hopefully for the future policy wise that, it will come down the ranks that there'll be payments for for these kind of producing you know supporting ecosystem services um kind of mixed feelings to be honest i mean i think things are definitely going in that direction in the sense that i know that the the um single farm payment eligibility criteria are being loosed, loosened up next year to allow farmers to have up to 50% of previously ineligible features on their land and still uh, get paid for the entirety of their land, which I think is a really positive development. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I really feel that we need to go beyond that. I, I, I feel that we need to give farmers, as I said, the option of being able to be paid farm subsidies for not farming their land. So if you have, for example, um, somebody in a place like the Bear Peninsula who's who has sheep on their land, uh, maybe very probably very very rough land, um, and if you if you do kind of a few calculations based on the amount of food coming off that land and wool. Uh, and factor in the amount that's been going in, whether it's in sheep nuts or um, or uh, hay and and fencing materials and veterinary materials and all the rest of it. You know what you're getting out for in compared to what you're putting in is negligible, mm -hmm. um, and you're also foregoing all of the wild native habitat that would all otherwise be there because when an area is grazed by sheep there's there's nothing you know mm -hmm. in, in biodiversity terms you're going to end up with virtually nothing so you're you're giving all of that up for almost nothing so it seems like you know the an obvious step to give farmers the option of saying well they could get paid the same amount for not having sheep there which as far as i understand it you know, even these new uh, rules to do with the basic farm payments, they don't cover that. So even if you can have, even if you have scrub on 50% of your land, mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say that you, you, that allows you to rewild 50% of your land because you still have to have uh, livestock ranging through that scrub. And I think we need to, we really need to 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 go the whole way and give farmers that option. I, but I think it's really essential to emphasize the word option. Mm -hmm. It mustn't be mandatory. There must be nothing forced on on farmers in that sense. It should be just an option. And those who who want to go down that road will have that choice. And those who don't and want to continue farming sheep or whatever else, they must absolutely continue to have that right. Mm -hmm.
Um, but I think I think ultimately, you know, society is going to come around to understanding how ludicrous it is to continue to to you know to force farmers to suppress natural habitat on the on their land, which is essentially the situation as it exists. I think also the one thing that I'm getting from what your your story is as well is it's not abandonment it's you you are managing for biodiversity in a very subtle way but you know you're making sure that that kind of rainforest is looked after to the best of its ability but in order to get it there you also kind of had to do a bit of management so I think a lot of people attach rewilding to perhaps you know sure fence it off and abandon you know yeah or that's a a mistaken idea because you know you that you, you do need to un, you need to continue undoing uh, the damage that we have done to ecosystems, such as removing invasive plant species or making sure that you know invasive species of herbivores don't get in on, and undo what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. That's all essential. So, you know, I mean, I think you know, for somebody who perhaps has another job or other other pressures in their life. It could be quite an attractive option to say, well, I'll I'll be paid to rewild the land because it requires a lot less input than, for example, running around the mountain after sheep. Mm -hmm. But it will always require some some input. Yeah. So on that, there's a the next question here is from Caroline Tayson. It's hi, I've managed to to have the opportunity to buy some land close to Alahis for the only reason to rewild it. I don't live in the area, though. Would it really be enough to make sure no goats or deer are grazing there, plus getting rid of invasive species, and then the land would do all the rewilding on its own? I mean, I know you've kind of answered this, but it might be good to reiterate what you were just... Yeah, I mean, the, the one thing I'd say is that out in Alahis, the, the problem you're going to have, it's very bare out there, you know, there's, there's practically no trees, for example. Uh, I think it's just been so so grazed so hard for so long that there's there's practically nothing left and rewilding you know for for habitat and wild species to return you do need to have source populations of all of those things to seed into an area and i think that's going to be an issue out there um also i would say that it's probably not ideal to be trying to do something like that if you're not there yourself because although, I mean, I don't, I don't think you'd need to be there constantly, but I think, you know, to be at least living there most of the time would be better because you need to be able to keep an eye on things and to just to understand what the land is doing by spending time in it on a regular basis and to, and to, to, to be kind of sensitive to the way the land is behaving and, and, and uh, changing. Um, you know, I mean, I, I continually tweak what I'm doing uh, based on my observations that are almost daily, you know. Uh, and I think if you were just kind of like dipping in and out every couple of months, you'd lose a lot of that understanding of, of, what, of what's happening in your land. But I mean, that's not to say you couldn't do it. I mm. think it'd just be better if you were, if you were there yourself most of the time. Yeah, and I think uh, like farming is a lifestyle and a community. It's part of feeding into a community. Absolutely. Uh, Julian Gallagher, how can we scale these type of initiatives? Any thoughts around that, Owen? Yeah, as I said, I think the key here is changing the farm payment system uh, and giving farmers the option of being paid to not farm their land. Because I think it's absolutely essential that... um, as you said, that it is that rewilding in Ireland is something that that comes from farmers and and rural communities rather than being imposed from from above or from outside. Um, Very recently, I was over in Scotland. I was invited over by an organization there called Scotland, the big picture, who are a rewilding organization. Been doing wonderful work over there in the in the Scottish Highlands, and we visited several several rewilding projects, including 
uh, Glenn Feshi, um, which belongs to a Danish billionaire called, yeah. I, hope I can say his name now. Uh, um, it's the biggest landowner, Hop- I think, Hoppelson. in the whole of... Hovelson yeah. is his name. And he owns, he's bought up several, quite an, about a dozen different massive estates in Scotland. But Glenn Feshi was the first. And I think it was, it's about 60,000 acres and it was pre- I don't know if it's me or Owen, but I lost Owen. Pretty huge. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Owen. Yeah, sorry, I lost you there for a while. Um, are you back? Okay. I am, I think. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I don't know if it was me or you that got lost, yeah. but uh, okay. sorry. Um, just in so, case, yeah, uh, everyone else so, got it. But it was, yeah, 60,000 acres and... Yeah. And, and the, when, when he arrived, uh, I think about 20 years ago, the, it was in a very bad state. There was, it was, there was no, no natural habitat there to speak of. Um, and so he started to bring the deer numbers down to a level in which natural regeneration of the trees could happen. Mm-hmm. And the whole place has absolutely come to life. And you're not talking about a little handkerchief of a place like my place. You're talking about a whole, you know, valley uh, mm-hmm. and mountains. And it's just absolutely wonderful to see this. Mm-hmm. And it shows what can what can be done. But the other side of it, so on, on the ecological side of it, you've got absolute wonders happening there, you know, I mean, and they've reintroduced beaver and they're talking about bringing back the lynx and all sorts of really exciting cutting edge stuff. You know, they're, they're re- they really are decades ahead of us. Mm-hmm. But on the downside of all this, and there is a big downside, is that it's based on a highly inequitable uh, land ownership uh, pattern. Mm -hmm. which makes this possible that you can have one guy come in and say right tomorrow we're doing all this over my 60,000 acres Uh, and as I said it it makes things happen very fast and things can happen in a very positive way in an ecological sense but in a social sense that's far from ideal Mm -hmm. but I think in Ireland things are very different because land ownership is much more fragmented and I think that's a positive. I think, I think here we have to make it happen in a way that is inclusive uh, and beneficial to to um, farmers and to rural communities, and and in a way that they actually take ownership of the whole thing and are behind it rather than being you know it being imposed by a, a Danish billionaire or whatever you know. Uh, absolutely, I think it's really important to think about the communities as part of the ecosystem as well. Uh, Eamon Hartnett has asked, hi Owen, I was thinking of rewilding a 38 piece land on the Ivora Peninsula, coastal mountainous opposite Berra. It's overgrazed with hardly any large tree species such as oaks. How would one begin? Would you plant trees or would you just let it slowly take hold with whatever hawthorns, etc., are there? Yeah, very difficult for me to say uh, without knowing the place. I mean, I think one thing that's really really crucial to say is that every every place where you're doing something like this has its own um criteria and circumstances and the key the key um thing that i would recommend in any case any to anybody who's interested in doing anything like this is to get to know the piece of land and everything that's happening there intimately so You know, but saying that, you know, the the things that I would be looking at would be a um, are there are there deer in the area? Because if there if there are, they will inhibit the natural regeneration of any trees that you might have. Mm -hmm. Um, If if there are, then you'd have to be looking at solutions to that, whether it's you know, looking for a, a grant maybe under the native woodland scheme to, to put up a fence or or else trying to engage uh, local, local uh, shooters who might come in and try and reduce the deer numbers in the area. 
those are really your only two options as things stand. Um, and then in terms of, you know, what trees you have in the area, I'd be once once you've um, once you've removed the problem of overgrazing, if there is one, I would be looking at what just comes up. And, and as I said, just getting to know the area and getting to know what's around, because I'm sure that once once um, he knows the local area, he will find that there are pockets of wild native trees growing locally and that the seed will probably blow in or the, the acorns might be carried in by jays or whatever else, you know, but a lot of the time it's just kind of like look, watch and observe, you know, uh, before you start deciding what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um... Hi Owen, this is Pat McCarthy. Have you ever seen a situation where you can earn a livelihood on the land? A lot of us depend on another source of income. Um, as I said, you know, I mean, there's the only way of earning a livelihood from the land down here is by farming it. Uh, and as I said earlier, that absolutely needs to change. I, I think that the key measure if we want to turn around the collapse of nature and biodiversity in Ireland the the, the 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 most important thing that we need to be doing is giving farmers the option of being paid to rewild their land and not farm it at all mm -hmm. but that that obviously you know it, it it's 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 not the situation at the moment so I'm not sure if that answers the question but that's the best I can do really no, yeah, that's good. So, oh, and you yourself, I mean, you carry out farm walks and you do education with local school children um, and you carry out a bit of citizen science. I, I read somewhere that you had over 50 species of birds recorded on your farm. How important is it to you that you, you have your story, but that you actually kind of share it with other people and share the knowledge and kind of educate from the very young up? Um, to fellow farmers and uh, to anyone that with an interest in this area? It's very important to me. And that's why, as I said, I wrote my, the, I, I wrote a book, uh, An Irish Atlantic Rainforest, was to try to get my experiences out there. Um, one, of, one of the things, as I said at the outset, I think one of the big problems we have in Ireland is that people it's very difficult for people to relate to, um, to wild nature in this country because it's so difficult to experience it. I mean, if you, if you go to our national parks, for example, which should be, you know, in most of Ireland is just fields or the uplands are, are grazed bare by sheep. And then you've got bits of kind of Sitka spruce plantations here and there in between. And that's, that's essentially what most of Ireland is. It's, it's, it's a big, uh, farm, uh, whether farming trees or food, and there's almost no space left for wild nature. So when you talk about wild nature in Ireland, people, it's it's an abstract concept for people. Um, and as I say, like even our even our um, national parks that should be exceptions to that are absolutely not. They're they're completely trashed. Killarney National Park, which is near here is totally wrecked by overgrazing. It's in, it's in exactly the same state as my own place was when I arrived. Um, but, you know, really depressingly, I've, as, as I've seen my own place come back to booming health um, over the last 13 years, I've watched Killarney National Park stay in exactly the same state or get worse, you know? Mm. So, that's one of the major obstacles for people is that they really don't have anything that they can kind of go and look at and say, oh, that's what that's what a, a, a healthy native woodland looks like, or that's what wildness is in an Irish context. So I see my place as in, in some kind of a way trying to provide that for people. Now, the obvious danger there is because it's only a very small place is if i had constant large groups of people tramping through the place it would actually adversely impact everything i'm trying to do ecologically mm -hmm. um so 
you know, I, I did have a plan to have a kind of an ecotourism based project around around here in, in the woods and that, but I never followed through on it, partly because insurance was turned out to be very uh, costly. Mm. Uh, and then my sculpture business got busy, busy anyway, but uh, but it was also for that reason. So I try to find other ways of getting the message across in ways that don't require people actually constantly coming in, you know, mm -hmm. and the book was probably the main way that I've done that. But I also use Twitter uh, and other social media and I give talks and I do stuff like what I'm doing this evening. Yeah, good. Um, if you were, I mean, what would you say to a conventional farmer that is thinking perhaps of making this jump? Like, where is a good place to start or where is a good place to kind of get some advice uh, on where to start, you know, who is looking to maybe, you know, manage for more biodiversity on their land? I mean, I, the, I think the indispensable uh, first step there is to, is to really start trying to understand how ecology works. And that's what I did when I, when I moved down here, I started, you know, insatiably reading everything I could about native woodland ecology and how ecosystems work and just thinking and spending time in nature and and you know thinking it all through and and finding your passion for it you know but i i can't emphasize emphasize enough that i think as i said earlier it's really unreasonable to expect farmers to do that at the moment because you know who could who how can who's going to give up their livelihood most people wouldn't and couldn't do it and so we can't expect farmers to do it and that's why the the uh, farm subsidy system needs to change to facilitate those farmers who would like to make that change and start bringing nature back onto their land Fair enough. i've just one more question here from the for the audience and then uh, then we'll wrap up um rory mcguire has asked owen uh, can i ask why you're not diversifying into other food sources for example food forests orchards with chickens feeding from pests etc what are your thoughts on permaculture and then the second part of his question is also does fencing off many areas not stop native animals from increasing their habitat why can't you hunt deer and eat the meat yourself sorry for all the questions <laughs> <laughs> i hope i can remember all that <laughs> yeah um, well for the for the first bit the per permaculture bit I, I'm, I have no problem with, it, with any of those kind of ideas. I think we need to be hugely creative in terms of how we approach food um, production in Ireland going into the future. I think the more people are trying different things, the better. But I also think that we need to have areas that are set solely aside, set aside solely for nature. Um, you know, um, and that's what I'm trying to do. If if you're farming land, uh, that's that's inevitably going to compromise natural processes at some level, and that needs to be understood. Um, and so, while we need to be farming in a much more nature friendly way, we also need to be setting areas of land aside solely for nature. And I'm trying to find a balance between those, those two things. Mm -hmm. um, and as, as represented by the high nature value farming that I carry out with the Dexters uh, on the one hand and the rewilding that I do uh, as well. Um, as, as regards um, di diversifying if I if I'm I'm trying to remember the question now, but you know, Dexters are really the easiest. They're 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 the best thing for the type of land that you have here. You know, mm -hmm. um, and probably if I had more time, I'd go into growing crops of some sort. But I find that I'm already fairly stretched in terms of all the things I have to do between my business and and and. The, and the the cattle and and everything else and I'm, I'm kind of happy with the way things are for now but you know it is something that's evolving as time goes by mm -hmm. and then just the other question of uh, does fencing off the area not stop native animals 
from increasing their habitat? They um, sneak through the deer fences. I don't think so. I mean, I I I, uh, I often see you know uh, I I know that badgers and foxes and pine martens uh, do are able to find their way through the fence. They they find gaps or or other ways of getting through, and that's not a problem for them. Um, and I guess we just have no other. I mean, certainly in this area, there are no bigger native. Uh, there's no bigger native fauna here anyway, bigger than those things. So that's not really an issue, do you know? Mm -hmm. Well, Owen Dalton, it's been, uh, it's been great chatting to you this evening. It's very admirable what you're doing down there in, on the Barra Peninsula. You, and uh, if anyone is interested in seeing more of Owen's work, he's, like he says, he's on social media. You can follow him on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram and and read the book by and the book. he read the book which is called <laughs> an Irish Atlantic rainforest um and it sounds like it's really nice I was telling Owen earlier it's it's beside my bed I just have to finish one more book and then I'm onto it um I hope you enjoy it really. so people exactly I'm sure I will I'm after <laughs> chatting to you I feel very inspired by it all um but it's really nice to have such kind of eloquent speakers like yourself speaking up for nature and you know, and the amount that you bring it into your, your farming practices and what you set out to do um, is very admirable. And I have to say, at wife, partner, family, dragging them all down to West Cork as well. It's for, it wasn't just yourself. So I'm sure yeah, that there's a whole team of very admirable Daltons in the background. Um, so, um, and if anyone would like to see the short film on Owen's uh, farm, it's on our YouTube channel, Farming for Nature YouTube channel. But, uh, and if you'd like to, if, if you know of anyone that would like to see tonight's session, it will be up on our YouTube channel by tomorrow. Um, and we'll hopefully have a farm walk on Owen's farm, perhaps next year as far as part of our Farming for Nature farm walk series. Um, meanwhile, next, our next Farming for Nature Q&A is on the 22nd of November with Ambassador Andrew Chilton from County Roscommon. So do register through farmingfornature.ie. Um, but until then, thanks again to you, Owen, and thank you to thank all of you, us for Bridget. joining us. Uh, and that was a really great session. So thanks for that. Great. We'll see, thank chat you. to you all soon. Bye bye.